Welcome to the Westside Investors Network. Win your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. And now, AJ and Chris Shepard. Hello, and welcome to the West Side Investors Network. This year, we're launching a new segment on the show, The Deal Deep Dive. These are many episodes where our featured guests will share their unique stories on a specific deal they've participated in. We will go deep on all aspects of the deal, from finding it to making the offer, due diligence, and more. Do us a solid and smash that subscribe button, leave us a rating, and further your investing journey. All right, Chad, thank you for joining me today on the Deal Deep Dive with the West Side Investors Network. Chad Zdenek here from CSQ Properties. Chad, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me on the show, Trent. I appreciate it. So I started out as a civil engineer a long time ago. Started out actually working for Boeing on the space shuttle main engines as an engineer. While I was getting my MBA, I was helping my brother kind of start his business. It was a lighting business and it was kind of my pet project because I was focusing on entrepreneurial studies. Eventually, pretty early on, I left Boeing and went to work with him full time. We built that business pretty good size in about 15 years to about 75 people and three warehouse locations. And then he he bought me out and I went into real estate full time. I'd been in construction management for some time. I got my general contractor's license. So I'd always been around real estate and then just decided to do it full time after I sold the business in 2018. And I've been doing that ever since. When your brother brought you out, did you plan on starting a new chapter? Yeah. So and it was a, a bit of a process to kind of figure that out. Yeah, you know, I like to tell people, you know, starting a new business in your 40s is totally different than starting a business in your 20s. And now I've got five kids and it's it's a totally different animal. I recommend doing it in your 20s and not your 40s. But I mean, you got, you have experience, right? And maybe some money in the older you are. So that helps. But you're definitely pulled in a lot of different directions that make it a bit more challenging, especially with family and kids are always the hardest to say no to. And unfortunately, anyone who's an entrepreneur, they know that they do need to say no to a lot of things when they're growing and scaling a business. So that's the phase that I've been in for a while. But you know, it's good. I'm an entrepreneur. It's what I really enjoy doing. So I actually kind of to answer your question, I took some time to really figure out what I wanted to do knew I wanted to get into real estate and I just didn't know in what capacity. Actually, I hired a coach to help me work through some of those things and finding my why. And that was really helpful. And then once I figured that out, maybe it took like six months of like really diligent work, like meeting once a week and kind of sorting through things to really figure out, you know, on creating CSQ properties. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So you landed on CSQ, obviously. Tell us about CSQ Properties. Obviously, you went through, you know, like you said, six months of really diligent work. How did you land on getting into syndications and investing into larger commercial properties? So initially, I was actually going to be doing flips, you know, house flips, because I had, like I said, a background in construction, and that kind of seemed like a logical step. And I was really kind of gearing up towards that. I actually put a business plan together for it. And then I was learning more about multifamily and syndications. I had a mentor in my entrepreneurs group called the Entrepreneurs Organization that I've been a part of for a while. And they, you know, him and actually even my wife were kind of encouraging me to just go bigger with multifamily and work with other people's money along with mine. And so I just did that. So I skipped the whole house flip thing. Really glad I did skip it. (laughs) and just went straight into real estate. So my first deal was in 2019. My first syndication rather was in 2019. I bought a 10 unit building in Long Beach here in LA and I've been at the races ever since. Let's talk about the 10 unit in Long Beach. 
everyone's first deal, at least in my experience and all the people that I've talked with are definitely the most hectic and stressful. But once you get them done, you learn tenfold from any other thing that you've done in real estate. It seems like up until that point, how did you approach that first deal once you found it? So I think a big part of it is working with brokers on finding those deals. They're the gatekeepers for most of these properties. And I had a great broker I was working with in Long Beach, super experienced guy. And so, yeah, he actually had been helping me for a while. I'd underwritten a bunch of different deals just to kind of get comfortable with the process and what I was looking for. And then when we found one, I put an offer in on it. And so this was 2019, which was, you know, really hot market. They didn't give you any appraisal contingency or any loan contingencies or anything like that. Basically, I only had like a 10 day inspection, maybe 12 day inspection period. It was pretty nerve wracking, like, right? I mean, it's, it was a $2 million building. I had a raise, it was a value add deal. I had to raise 1.2 million, which was like 500K for a construction, about 700K for the down payment. So it was a big raise for my first one and very, very nerve wracking. So I already had like maybe 100K hard, right? From day one, which was my money or day 10, depending on how you look at it. And then, so I hadn't really raised any of the money yet, but my money was already hard, meaning non-refundable. And then I had to start raising money and that's what I was working towards. I had 100K minimum, which might be higher than most for their first deal. But again, I had you know just learned from a lot of people that just say, go high right away. And that's what I did. So it was really nerve wracking because I didn't have all the money up until the very end. And I also didn't get final loan approval until like the week before we were closing. So it was like really, really, really stressful. I think the last week before we closed, I finally raised my last 100K and then got the loan approval in the same week. But up to that point, man, it was really, really nerve wracking for sure. So it sounded like about 500 grand in renovation or construction budget. What needed to be done to these 10 units? So it was just a really heavy cosmetic lift. Basically, everything on the inside except for moving walls. So new kitchens, new cabinets, new flooring, new light fixtures, new windows. Some of them took new doors, new AC units. It was a lot. We actually did that pretty quick. I think we allocated like 10 months or so to do it. And we finished it like in seven or eight. So we finished ahead of schedule on budget, which was nice. I hired a GC to run it for me, even though I'm a GC, but I don't do it every day. So you really need someone who you know, is doing it day in, day out. But it helps with that background to be able to keep an eye on things, certainly a budget and design, especially today. I mean, today things could get really out of control fast because everyone's so busy and, and backlogged. But even back then, you still had to keep a pretty close eye on things. And yeah, so we finished that rehab in seven or eight months and re-tenanted it. It's been great ever since. We did a, a refi, actually did a refi last year we actually had an earn out part of the loan, which meant like the original loan documents had an extra portion of the loan that they would leverage up as long as we hit our marks, which we did. So, so today, like everyone's gotten at least half their money back on that deal and they still have all their equity in it. So their passive income continues to go up each year and they only have half their money still left in the deal. So it's, it's been a great project. And I'm just really glad that, I don't know, you get nervous, you know, because people are, are investing in you, right, on the first deal. And you get worried that you really want to be able to, to do what you say you're going to do. And sometimes it doesn't happen, especially on the first deal. So the fact that I've been able to do that, I was really happy about it. And I think it's been a great deal for all the investors. I'm actually the largest investor in that deal with my own money. But still, I brought it was me plus nine others investors on that deal. So for your first deal, how did you, when you were talking with investors and raising capital, how did you get them to buy into your plan and trust that, you know, you may not have the track record, obviously you were successful in other businesses and other ventures, but how did you get them to really believe in your plan for your first syndication? I think the bulk of it was my background. So, you know, being a general contractor, a professional engineer in construction management, like all those puzzle pieces helped. I grew and scaled the business, which helped. And then I also had my broker 
also invested in the deal, which was great. So I could say, hey, look, I've got a lot of money in this deal. The broker's got money in the deal. This is my background. This is the plan. And so I think from that standpoint, it was made it a little bit easier for them to be comfortable with that type of investment. And it wound up being, you know, friends, family, acquaintances on that first one. Actually, I, only, I think I only had one investor that I didn't know. But yeah, I mean, it worked out good. And was your plan all along to refinance after two and a half, three years, or did you ever plan on selling it? So th- for that one, the plan was a five-year hold. So we're still inside of that. But then I, the earn out part of the loan was always part of the plan. The cash out refi would have been like a bonus, although we didn't really bank on it. But I wound up last year, actually like in April, was it April? Yeah, April of this last year, I just refinanced it. So I started in February, so I locked in some really good rates, closed in April just before things started going through the roof, interest rate wise. So yeah, I locked in another loan for, what's I think another five years actually on that loan. So I don't know that we'll keep it the whole time, but it's hard to get rid of these properties when you have really good debt on it right now. So we're probably inclined just to hang on to it and enjoy the passive income. Because if we sold it and got into something else, the debt's going to be way higher. So we don't have any plans to sell it right now. And so you bought it for $2 million. You put half a million into it for renovations. What did the property appraise at two and a half, three years later? I think we appraised at two nine. I want to say. Yeah. So a you know, 50% increase, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. In two years, not bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's done well. And now, here's a word from our sponsor. Get things done while you're on the move. Learn more about working with a virtual assistant through off-site professionals. It's a great way to get all the things done that you need to get done. Have freedom in your time and streamline your life by automating your business. Stop spending time on the tasks that you can delegate and start spending more time on your superpower. Call us today at 503 503- 446-3177 or visit our website at offsiteprofessionals.com. When you guys took it over, did you empty all 10 units at once or did you renovate units as they came vacant? Yeah, we always prefer to stagger it. But so we were issuing notice to vacates, like a 60-day notice to vacate, but we did it on a staggered schedule. I never like to have an entire building vacant. It's always good to, I believe, one, for cash flow, but two, just to always have people there just to keep an eye on it just because they're living there. So we did like, I think we were doing like maybe three or so units at a time and staggered it. And some tenants would just move out of their old unit and move into a renovated unit. And that's always a big win for, you know, for both parties when that happens. You know, they literally just move all their stuff just down the hall, which is nice. And you know, the tenant, you know, their pay history and all that stuff. So, so that's ideal when that can happen. And it did happen for some tenants. I mean, I've never invested in California. So when you talk about notice to vacate and tenants moving units, obviously we have similar tenant landlord laws here in Oregon. I've always heard the San Francisco horror stories and and everything like that. Is there strict tenant laws where you're investing at in California? Yeah. And those are always changing too. So it's gotten a bit more strict since 2019. And especially during COVID, it's gotten pretty tough. So it gets expensive because usually you have to pay a certain number of months rents, relocation fees, stuff like that. But there's a lot of different jurisdictions. So like you have you know statewide rent control, you've got city of LA rent rules, you got LA County rent rules, and then different cities like City of Beverly Hills, City of Santa Monica. Everyone's got like it's kind of a patchwork of rules. And you always have to follow the most stringent ones. For us in Long Beach, we weren't part of LA City. So that helped because they're even more strict in LA City. But in Long Beach, I mean, certainly it's more strict than a lot of other places in the country. And we actually, you know, we're recording this in December 2022, and we still have an eviction moratorium here (laughs) in LA. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. And it's right now it's extended till the end of January of next year. And, you know, they may or may not extend that. We're hoping that they don't. But it's just crazy the way how difficult it is for landlords, you know, and it's frustrating because then they wonder why everything is so expensive, but they make it so hard on the landlords. And then we have to pass those costs onto the tenants. And that's part of the reason why it's as expensive as it is. So I don't see that changing 
And for us, we've been doing a lot more investing out of California in the last year, in part because of all these changes that are happening here in California. I still have the properties here, but we're not buying in California right now. So when you were underwriting this deal from, you know, when you first saw it, do you take into consideration the costs for relocation and then compare those to the rent premiums that you're going to get after renovation? Yeah. Yeah. You definitely, you definitely have to do that. Sometimes there's some flexibility there. So I think it's always better to kind of err on the safe side and err, you know, assume it's going to be more expensive than you think. But yeah, that's pretty important because it, it makes a difference. The other big thing too, is you talk about like economic vacancy, you know, if you're planning on a, let's say an eight month construction time, but it really takes you a year or a year and a half, that's going to be a big difference on the deal. And that's why it's really important to really stay on top of the construction because you're just, you're bleeding money if that's not done. And going back to speaking of construction, you said it's 10 units. How many beds and baths are in these units? Are they all the same? Yeah. So that one is two units or two bedroom, two bath. And the other ones are all one bedroom, one bath. Okay. Do you think, I mean, two bedrooms and smaller typically are pretty straightforward when it comes to construction. Do you think that's why you were able to get it done in seven months versus 10, like you had budgeted for? Not necessarily. I think we knew what we were renovating. We had a little bit of padding in there just in case. And they were, I don't know, it's like 2019 was different. Like right now with the supply chain issues we have and back orders, like it's a lot tougher right now. We're dealing with this on one of our properties in Orlando. It's a, a much bigger building and everything's done, but we're waiting for appliances, you know, and it's like you got these units that are sitting there. They're all brand new and ready to go. And sure enough, you've got a four week delay on appliances it just sucks that you have to deal with that. And it's really hard to plan ahead where those delays are going to be, you know, and no matter what you do, it's really hard to work through the, some of those things because you're talking about like nationwide sh shortages, right? So that makes it really tough. And that building, yeah, I mean, we're ahead of schedule in one regard, but we're behind the schedule in another regard. So there's pluses and minuses. But I guess my point is that in today's world, there's a lot more uncertainty when it comes to construction delays and supply delays. And how do you account for that? That's really, really tough to figure out. It's hard. It's tough out right now. I heard someone say the other day, budgeting for construction material delays is a shot in the dark and there's no way to really budget for it just because you have no idea when, yeah. what's going to get delayed and how long it's going to get delayed right now. Yeah. So like one of the pivots we're doing, I think in this world, like we're always adjusting to the market, adjusting to what we learn and how things are changing all the time. And one of the ways that we're doing that is we're doing much shorter or quicker rehabs. So we might just do like flooring and paint and that's it. And just get someone back in there. Our rent bumps aren't going to be as high, but we know we're not going to be sitting on a vacant unit for months on end waiting for some of this stuff. So on the plus side, we get it turned over a lot quicker, but the negative side, we're not getting as much of a rent bump. But in our opinion, it's a lot better to do that than to have it sit vacant. So that's just like a, one example of a pivot that we're doing to try to keep us on track for the original plan while making adjustments along the way. Yeah. And I mean, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the current market. Everyone's talking about the state of the economy right now and all the uncertainty that we have going forward. Coming from this property that we're talking about in 2019, everything was hotter than, you know, I'll get up. A lot of competition. Now it seems like things are still competitive to an extent. What's your take on the current climate for both property values and rents, where those, you know, where rents are going to go? And do you think people will still be selling real estate that has already been renovated, like syndications that have already been renovated? Or do you see people holding until there's a little bit more stable ground in our economy right now? Well, I think the biggest driver of that is going to be the debt. And, you know, we've got a debt bomb with these bridge loans that people have gotten in the last couple of years that, you know, in their underwriting, they weren't assuming that the interest rates were going to be double what they were at, right? That's not, right. that was not in their underwriting. So those are going to be distressed assets that are coming on the market, which I think will affect pricing, you know, right? We've already been seeing a lot of retrades and a lot of discounts on some of the sale price. I do think it's going to be driven by the debt. And if someone can hold on to their property, they're going to hold on to it, right? If they've got good debt on it, they're most likely going to hold on to it. Now, I 
believe that we're in a pretty severe inventory shortage when it comes to units. You know, anywhere from two to six million units short, depending on who you talk to. And I think that's going to keep driving the price up for rents. So I do think we're going to have strong rent growth, but the problem is going to be on the debt side with, you know, having, you know, these huge debt increases on refinances that weren't accounted for is definitely going to put some downward pressure on pricing. I think it'll be by area too. I mean, like anything, real estate is always area by area. And, you know, you've got a a thousand people a day moving to Florida. You know, that's a lot of upward pressure there, despite what might be happening on the debt side. So you've got some big tailwinds like that that can really help an area like Florida. You know, places like LA, like we're not really building a whole lot in LA. So that creates a shortage on inventory. And even when you can build it, it's super expensive. So I think that's going to help in that regard as well. So overall, I think rent growth will be strong. I think vacancies are going to be low. But the thing that I'm watching out for is is when these bridge debt deals come due. I've actually never I've never heard that opinion before where you're talking about the debt. Debt being obviously debt is the issue right now, but there's so many places that have rent control and capped rent raises. Do you think places like that, whether it's Oregon or California or Washington or wherever you're at that has rent control, do you think that those areas are going to be able to keep up with the increase in or the you know the increase in debt or the cost of debt? I guess I'm confused on the connection there. What do you mean? So obviously rents have, it makes sense for rents to increase given the current state and the shortage of units, but with debt being so much more expensive in places that have rent control. So if your debt has doubled and say a a person in Oregon needs to refinance, but your debt is now doubled the rate that is, do you think a place like Oregon that has a 9.9% rent cap those projects and those properties are going to be able to afford that higher cost and debt. I think they could have big problems. And I think the rent control, you know, is, you know, ongoing, never ending debate on rent control. But I think if you look at the places that do have rent control, what happens is the development is subdued and there's never enough development going on in, in these rent control areas. And so then what happens is the exact opposite effect of what the rent control proponents want. They want pricing to stay low and go down, but that doesn't happen because there's not enough building and development in these areas. So I don't know. I think it's a classic case of, you know, someone trying to do something good and the exact opposite happens. And if the numbers aren't penciling out because you're in a rent control area, what do you do? You don't develop there, right? I mean, it's like the numbers don't make sense. So then what are you left with? You're left with, government subsidized housing, section eight type housing that's driving the market and, you know, increasing taxes because, you know, the people that live there aren't paying for it. And I don't think that cycle ends very well. I mean, look, I'm a landlord. Maybe that's why I'm against against rent control, but you can look in the cities where they have this and it, it doesn't achieve the results that they hope it achieves. So typically what would happen is, let's say you have a rent control unit, stays stays below market, You know, unfortunately, all your maintenance costs, insurance costs, everything else is tagged to the market. So that stuff goes up, goes up, goes up. Rent control units are limited, but nothing else is. So people won't end up developing in these areas, developing there because the numbers don't make sense anymore. It doesn't make sense to to limit one side of the equation, rent or the income, and not do anything on the liability side. That's part of the problem that we've had during COVID and these eviction moratoriums, right? you know, these landlords have been taking a lot of a lot of hits with tenants not paying their rent and nothing else has stopped along the way. So, you know, people like me, we've decided that we're not going to invest in California anymore and investing in other areas. And so now you've got these other areas where there's, you know, it's booming for them and doing really well. And some of these other areas are having a tough time. I agree. I agree 100%. So, Going back, last thing about this 10 unit, what do you think the biggest lesson that you took away from completing your first deal? Obviously, you're you're still holding it. You haven't am I, disposed of it yet or traded it, I guess. You haven't traded the deal yet. What's the biggest takeaway that you took away from that process going through your first one? Let's see. I think the team is key and we hear about that all the time. And that was my experience. 
having, you know, a good contractor, good property management company, good brokerage team. I don't think I've really focused much on the bank or debt side, but that's becoming more and more important today. I had a deal that I was refinancing last year or this year, but earlier in the year, and the bank pulled out like day 58 on a 60 day close. And like when they pulled out, interest rates were like 2% higher. I think if I would have had maybe better relationships with my bankers, then maybe that could have been avoided. That's an area where I probably haven't focused on as much and is becoming more and more important in this debt environment. But the other pieces, I think we're all there and having a solid team, I think is really critical to a solid deal. And how would you go about putting together the solid team? Where did you connect with these people that are on your team? Yeah. So a lot of it was referrals and kind of like networking and getting to know different people and different groups. My broker was a huge asset in getting that dialed in because he was plugged in on a lot of these areas. So that was really helpful. I would say like now I focus a lot more. I go to a lot of conferences and network with a lot of people. And I think that's pretty key. You know, real estate is very much a relationship based business. And you got to invest in those relationships. The wrong time to ask for it is when you need it, right? You should be developing those relationships before you need the help. And that just takes a lot of time, takes energy to do that. But it's going to yield a lot better results when you finally need something and you've already got these relationships to lean on. That's very true. I like the way you phrase that a lot. The worst time to ask for something is when you need it. I agree with that. (laughs) <laughs> well, Chad, is there anything else you want to say today or anything, any way that people can connect with yourself or find CSQ properties? Yeah. So basically Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook is all CSQ properties. Also our website, csqproperties.com. Any of those areas are the best way to get in touch with us. Awesome. Great. Chad, thank you again so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I enjoyed hearing about your first syndication deal. And I look forward to seeing what you got going on in the future. Cool. Thanks, Trent. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. Thank you again and enjoy your day.